The daughter of a Miami cop was an entertainer. Ask her about the picture of her around five years old, fully embodying Minnie Mouse. She thought about being a musician, an oboist, but a visit to the scene shop at University of South Florida changed her direction, and her fascination with scening and lighting design began, landing her in the MFA program at Penn State. And then she worked on stage, on film, and television, ending up as a professional in Chicago. A position in part-time teaching led her into the world of academia, and she ended up via Peoria and her husband Brad, hi Brad, uh, at Hastings College. And not finding all of that enough, she's now pursuing a PhD in arts management and education. I gotta admit, at times she tires me out. <laughs> But it has been an amazing four years so far, working with her on stage, off stage, and in the real world. So here comes someone you're going to be glad to get to know a little better. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, and thank you. First off, I wanted to say thank you to the faculty who nominated me and the students who chose me as the invited faculty lecturer for the spring this semester. Um, I am very excited to present to you in ma uh, Creating Imagined Spaces, which is one of my passions and my loves um, in this world, as you can tell, Star Wars, Muppets, and wrestling are just some of the few. So I thought, what better way to introduce you to the artist that I am than by introducing you to me? If, yeah, there we go. This is me. I've been around the performing arts my entire life. I've had really supportive parents who really encouraged me uh, since I was a very young person. According to my mom, I used to sneak out of daycare when I was a year and a half to go to dance ballet class because I was bored and I wanted to do something more exciting. So I began my dance career at 18 months and then started playing on a Casio piano. My parents put me into a piano lessons, then went into flute, piccolo, oboe, got into musical theater, and then found this. After graduation for high school, I was determined to be a music educator. I was going to be conducting Broadway orchestras and just doing everything. I had a path of exactly where I was going to go. And then I went to go see The Music Man. It was the touring Broadway show revival, and I was going as a graduation present. I was really excited. I'm sitting in the first row balcony, had the whole stage to myself. The musical starts playing. I'm singing and dancing in my head, of course. Don't want to embarrass everybody. And then as soon as Professor Harold Hill goes to uh, Marion Peru's house, or Marion the Librarian's house, my life changed forever. He goes to this front of this door, it's right here. And he walks in and he asks her if he can come talk to her. And the moment that he does, the stage opens up like an accordion. It pops out and open. And now we can see the entire interior of this home. I spent the entire last hour and a half of that production trying to figure out how in the world they did that. And my mind was blown. The next, uh, next month I started college, took theater as an elective, changed my major to scenic design, and I never looked back. So what is scenic design? Anyone who's ever watched a movie or a play has most likely noticed the backgrounds and the settings during the performance. Oftentimes, the setting of a play can give, off, uh, give us an inside look of what the performance is going to be like. Scenic design uh, is basically all the elements of scenery, furniture, props that an audience sees. A set designer's job is to create the physical surroundings uh, where the action is going to take place. A theater set should suggest the style and the tone of a production, create the mood and the atmosphere, give clues to a specific time and place, give, uh, offer creative possibilities for movement and groupings of actors. We're creating the world of the play or the central picture of what you're going to see. So when we think of a designer, when we think of theater technicians, a lot of times we just think of the grunt work or working with power tools, as I like to say. But there's a lot of actual research um, and critical thinking that comes with the design process. The design process for a set designer is very similar to a lighting and a costume designer. We start off by reading the play a lot. I read it at least three times before I even start doing any sketches. First time for content. Second time with a 
pink highlighter to go through and mark all the scenic elements, and the second time with a yellow highlighter to mark all the prop elements. So I can visually see with colors things that I need and things that we'll need to use. The next thing is I usually do a script analysis. What's going on in the play? How can I get the metaphors or the interpretation of what the playwright is trying to say? Next, I get to work with the director, who usually creates the directorial concept or the style of the production. There, they usually give me some sort of feedback. I'm thinking of going in a Tim Burton style. I'd really like to go 1930s instead of the traditional 1950s. That kind of figuring out what their viewpoint's gonna be so we can collaborate and make the best production possible. I then get to create initial sketches, renderings and white models, a colored model, draftings, shop time, and then production. So I thought for this uh, presentation, I was going to use one of my design productions as kind of the step-by-step -step process of what a set designer does. The one that I've decided to show for you is Deflator Mouse, which is an operetta uh, by Johann Strauss II. Uh, this production was done at Penn State in 2008, and it was one of the first full stage operas that they had done um, in a, quite a few years. I was very honored and lucky to be one of the grad students that was given the design position for this show. All the other designers were faculty. Um, I was given a pretty good budget, uh, but not as much as I would have <laughs> if they would have let me do everything I wanted. So without further ado, I thought I would start off this, uh, this part of the presentation by showing a quick video of the PBS special that was done on the video, excuse me, on the presentation. Coming up on Music from Penn State, students and faculty from the Penn State School of Music and the School of Theater step on stage to delight you with... Good evening, I'm Joyce Robinson and we're backstage at the Playhouse Theater on the main campus of Penn State. Tonight you'll see what it takes to put on a fully staged opera and it's all being accomplished by wonderful young singers, keeping the opera tradition alive and well. Opera is an exciting, multifaceted art form, and one that's gaining ground with a more youthful audience than you might imagine. So when we decided to do this production, at Penn State, we was really trying to do a collaboration between the music and the theater department to create something new and interesting. Um, they had never done a production together, um, and again, in quite a few years. So when I met with the director, Lauren Meeker, um, she uh, was from the San Francisco Opera, and when I talked to her, she mentioned certain things that she wanted for her production. She gave me image words. She told me champagne. J, uh, jewel tones, she wanted a gilded birdcage, but the two actual words or images that she gave me that were tangible were Art Nouveau and Alphonse Mucha. I was like, yes, something I can actually research. If I put up champagne in Google, it's just gonna give me bottles, and maybe later, but not during the research process. So um, I started to look into the Art Nouveau style, and the reason why she wanted to go in this direction was that the operetta is very light, very frivolous, and very comical. So she wanted to go with the, night, uh, excuse me, the Art Nouveau style, which is very light, feminine, and has very, uh, I would say, very curvature, naturalistic shapes. Um, I used a lot of these shapes in my design to help create and enforce the feeling of the time period. Sorry, there's another one. I'll actually use this arch and this arch up here as part of my portal for the front of the stage. Here are some of Alphonse Mucha's work that I was using as inspiration. Again, jewel tones, uh, gold, lavenders, things that represent uh, abundance of wealth. So for the next part of my design work, after I do the research, I then have to start creating the actual physical model. I like to work in three dimensions. I'm not very much of a sketcher. If you ever look at my thumbnail sketches, they're literally the size of a thumbnail, maybe one by one, and then I blow them up so I can make them look bigger. Just work that way. But I like to work in three-dimensional form. So I actually work 
and what I like to call a sketch model or a white model. And that's where I take just white construction paper and I start figuring out what the space is gonna look like. I try to envision how the actors are going to move across the stage. What are gonna be the best stage pictures that I can create? Now with this particular one, I wanted to make sure that we had levels when someone, ooh, excuse me, that was not the pointer, levels. Uh, when someone was able to walk in. And one of the other necessities, for example, for the first scene was that we needed the lover to come through the balcony window. So we were able to create a contraption on the outside of the window that he swung in on and was able to come in. This is the final colored model. So after I do a white model, excuse me, I get to do a colored model. So after meeting with the director and getting everything finalized, this is the final representation in half inch model form of what my set or my world of the play is going to look like. This is act two. And act three. Now all three of the acts have special requirements and needs um, for the production. Act one needed to look more intimate and small because it was only the, uh, the only people in that scene were the husband, the lover, and the friend. The second act, act two, we had over 35 couples dancing and waltzing. So we needed to be able to amplify that space. And then in the third scene, we wanted to make it intimate again because it was supposed to be a gentleman's jail with gilded cages again. Frivolous, right? So we had to work into that way. So one of the things that I wanted to make sure that we created was if we were going to create a space that had multi-level use, that it really was functioning. So for act three, the actual gilded cages are made out of rebar and the actors could actually climb them to create multiple levels. So in the last final operatic song, we have a big wall of sound, which was really, really, really fun. So the next step, I know I'm going kind of fast, but the next step of the scenic design process is to work on draftings. Now, a lot of us think of draftings when it comes to architects, and that's kind of what we do, except I call it temporary construction. We don't need seven screws, we just, we just need two, we're gonna take it apart later. But with our scenic design, <laughs> draftings are the technical drawings of your set design that you will give to the technical director. Now in the scenic design world, or in the theater world, the set designer creates what the set should look like from the front. The technical director will then take your design and create the working drawings, which is what your set looks like from the back how to construct it, what kind of materials do you need, do we have enough budget for those materials, can we go from flat walls out of wood to fabric. They'll sit, them, they'll sit with me and kind of break down my design and say, we can't afford it, let's try to see how we can make it affordable. And that's kind of the way the theater works instead of film. Theater, we try to make it cheaper, film, you have more money because time is of the value there. So when we go to draftings, the first one that I'd like to show you is the main uh, drawing that is all done for all productions. And this is the ground plan. The ground plan is the bird's eye aerial view at that time. The things in the back in gray are where these place pieces need to be in the back of the space so we can make smooth transitions. Because part of my job is making sure when we go from act one to act two, one, you the audience isn't waiting 20 minutes, and three, we get a central picture or flow of choreography to make sure that we get everything done right. Um, so we have the storage back here is just as important as the other one. The next drawing we have here is mostly for lighting people and it's our sectional view. This basically shows the side view of the set so that the lighting designer can see where they're gonna hang the lights for the angle. If this is the top of my set, then he knows that he's gonna have to make something there or hang something here to be able to light that part of the stage. So it's another view, another angle of what the set design is gonna look like. The next ones are front elevations, and like I said, these are the drawings of what it's gonna look like from the front. It is not my concern how they're built, if they're Hollywood, which is thin flats, or if they're Broadway, which are much heavier, bulkier flats, which are walls, if you didn't know what I was talking about. So um, when we put these together, that's not my responsibility. That's the technical director's responsibility to help me figure out what's the best way possible. So I always try to go for the gold and then 
you know, end up with the bronze, but it's okay, we make it look like a gold. So here's some other uh, of the draftings for front elevations. And as you can see, they're basically showing the size of the particular piece, what the particular piece is, and any suggestions I may have. Like for the drop, I really wanted it to be heavy because we were going to do um, overlays onto it. So I wanted a specific weight of canvas. So I can make some request, and then he can tell me that's too much money and then We'll figure something out. So <laughs> after we deal with the draftings or the blueprints portion, we then get to do the painter's elevations. Now painter's elevations are when we look at uh, the practice of creating accurate representations of objects of artistic uh, and technical needs. So painter's elevations in theater are what these walls should look like once they are painted. Once you create these uh, painter's elevations, you then hand them off to the scenic artist. The scenic artist in theater is basically the person in charge of creating samples of what the paint wallpaper is gonna look like, what the floor is gonna look like, and kind of do all the legwork of organizing what your patterns and requests are. For my portal, or for my front entrance, my proscenium, I wanted to create, again, that Art Nouveau, kind of that window frame that I showed you feel, to kind of soften the edge of the stage. I also wanted it to feel kind of translucent and glass-like. Originally, in my first design, these were gonna be backlit, and lights were gonna change during the show, but I was told I, I couldn't afford it, so. <laughs> I had to settle with just painting them in a silhouette and dealing with it, but it's okay. But we did get to do something really cool with the floor, and the floor we were able to paint out. Now this floor is much larger than some of the stages we have here um, at Hastings College. This floor is about 120 feet wide, 60 feet deep, and the stage is 100 feet high because it has a fly system. So it is a much larger space. So when we talk about time constraints and really getting things done, it really is at all hands on deck effort whenever we do these kinds of productions because we need everybody's hands to make sure that we get it done. But with this set design, one of the things I wanted to do with the floor was to create those gilded champagne colors, the golds, the bronzes, but then have this nice lavender overspray that's very mystified on the sides to kind of emphasize and smooth out the sides of the room, especially since the floor is the only thing that can't change. We need to make sure that whatever the floor looks like in the boudoir of the uh, first room, in the uh, ballroom in the second room, and in the jail of the third room, all kind of still match. So for the front elevation for the act one walls, this is the sample of the Muka wallpaper. Uh, we created a simplified version of this wallpaper, which even though it was simplified with six different stencils, uh, to be able to create this pattern. Six is nothing, I've done more than that. <laughs> um, but it's really fun, and they were able to create this exact pattern, um, which was really something that I wanted, because trying to be able to buy wallpaper of this size, because in opera I always like to make things of a bigger size, because it's much larger of a space and design, but also being able to find something period and accurate, it's easier sometimes just to paint it ourselves. So with the drop, I got my canvas that I wanted, which was great, and we were able to create the looks that we wanted for this one as well. Oh, and with this one, Jim would love it. It was covered in glitter. <laughs> <laughs> No, just, just because that means it stays on the stage for the rest of your life and they just have to remember me, but anyways. Um, the last scene we wanted to do something kind of simpler and more romanticized. It was supposed to be a jail, but it's a gentleman's jail, which kind of means that it's for people who are very wealthy but drink too much and instead of putting them with the riffraff, they put them in this really, really pretty jail, which I was always like, Phew. I want to go there. That's not really punishment. That sounds awesome, especially when the first line is, "Can I have you? Can I, can I give you a brandy?" I'm just like, "What? This is insane." But um, basically, with all of these drawings that are then put together, we have a bunch of uh, several crew members, technicians, and artists who then put all of this work together. Um, we had a crew of about, I would say, between 40 and 60 students being able to put this entire production together when it comes to costume sets and lighting. So it was quite an undertaking for us to achieve. But I wanted to show you kind of what the final outcome was in this short little video.
actually gonna pause it really quickly there before it finishes. Um, oh, I can't do that, so I'll just go back. <laughs> Apologize. But in that particular production, some of the things that are interesting, um, that are just kind of tidbits, are when we were able, looking to do this production, I really wanted, I really wanted to be able to show a grandness. And one of the issues that we had was not being able to find a chandelier that was large enough to accompany the space that we had. Renting the chandelier from Phantom of the Opera was way more money that we had for this production um, with everything else that I was asking for. So one of the things that I have to do as part of my job is thinking out of the box, uh, which is a very cute phrase that is very used. But anyways, um, when we think of the center of the stage, when they bring back the camera, there's a large chandelier there. And we got a lot of compliments for it. And basically what we had to do was figure out how we were going to make it. So I went to Big Lots and I bought three of these very tacky 80s like arm, like lamps, and lots and lots of crystal, fake crystal uh, Christmas ornaments. And we flipped the uh, chandeliers upside down, added the Christmas tree ornaments, and it then went from a small chandelier to now an eight foot chandelier. We were able to create all of these new things. The other thing that's pretty interesting is the champagne that they have in their glasses is an actual champagne, because if they're dancing with it, they're gonna get on the costumes, and then I'm gonna get in trouble from the costume designer because their costumes got messy because of my props. So it's actually candle wax with uh, gold uh, crayons in it, and the candle wax create the bubbles that make it look like real champagne. So I thought that would be a cute little tidbit of information that we, uh, we kind of worked on for this production, especially with all the dancing that has to take place. <laughs> so the final product. This is the final color model. And this is the final look of the show. As you can see, my final color model ended up being really close to what the final design was gonna be like. There's certain changes that were made. Some of the walls are soft or curtains instead of being hard and vice versa. Um, but overall, the feeling and the effect was there. Here's a much more up close look of the wallpaper and Adele. Act two. Again, the space opens up. It has to really have enough space for the dancing. Also, those poofs that are on the side, the round chairs, those are uh, uh, seats that we also uh, made upholstered and put uh, pneumatic switches on them so that we can get them in and out of the stage fairly quickly uh, for transitions. Oh, there's the chandelier. Do you see it? There you go. And again, lots of people dancing. That platform on top was also wide enough to have about 10 couples dancing up there as well. So we had lots of levels, dimension, and be able to create a really beautiful stage picture because each one of the women's dresses was completely different and uh, specialized. And then we have act three. Oh, in act three, the show began with the jailer Let's, let's call him that, can't remember his official name. And he starts off in this act swinging on the light. That was quite a challenge, <laughs> figuring out the weight differential to be able to hang him up there without him falling. Good thing is he was also six foot five, so we only had to put a little ladder to get him up there. <laughs> but uh, it was really cool because it started off that part of the, the act kind of swimming on the light, and then he kind of jumps down and then talks to the audience a little, and then we get to finish the show and that's the final scene and again these cages here were able to be climbed on for that last final moment so I've shown you one of the set designs that I'm extremely proud of but I also wanted to show you some different styles and other design elements and other design uh, productions that I've been able to create and um, be able to be a part of so one of the other productions I wanted to talk about today was the cherry orchard now, The Cherry Orchard is a Russian play. 
just like all of his other plays. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> when uh, this particular play is all about the cherry orchard and now it's kind of hanging over this family. They're dealing with the fact that the cherry orchard is trying to be sold out underneath them. So as a designer, one of the things I wanted to make sure that I did was reinforce the idea of the cherry orchard. So in the rendered sketch that I have here, there's a cherry orchard drop all the way across the back, and there's also three cherry orchard branches that hang above the stage. Now for each act, the ones that hang above the stage move into different patterns to kind of show and represent different areas. Um, but the other thing I wanted to make sure that I did was the walls are made out of scrim. And it's a type of fabric where if you paint on one side and you shine light on it straight on, it's a solid. But if you shine light from the back, you can see through it. And I wanted to make sure that all my walls had that translucent effect to make sure that the cherry orchard was always on their mind. We could see the cherry orchard through the walls, through the feeling, to kind of reiterate the fact that that is another character in this play, even though he or she never speaks. It never speaks, probably more appropriate. And that's again with act two, which is more of the jail. I get to do fun stuff too. Alexander and the Horrible, Terrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. It's a children's show. It was one of my first and favorite shows. It was not actually something depressing to do. Very exciting. Um, but with Alexander and the Horrible, Terrible, No Good, Very Bad Day, the one thing that you want to make sure to do with children is big, bright colors, big, bold pieces. You don't need to do something so elaborate and so realistic. They use their imagination so much more than we do, which I envy so bad. So with my computer-aided uh, renderings, I had basically a very simple design. It was a large uh, book. Each side of the book was 18 feet by 14 feet tall, and they were just plain canvas, where we had two scrim lights, um, shining lights onto those books, so between each scene, we had a different color. So school was purple, the dentist was blue, so the walls were able to change color and create the effect without having to do too many things. For this design, I wanted the book to open, and again, I was told that was too expensive, so some of the pictures from that scene. Um, this copy machine in the book uh, takes over and starts exploding and like papers start going everywhere. That was a really fun prop to build. It's really, really great. And uh, one of the other things we got to do with this show was I got to create my own textile. In the book, it's really prominent and the only picture of color in the entire book is the cover. So I was able to create the pattern in Photoshop and then plot out in a large format printer on fabric the pattern that I wanted and then I sewed a quilt together making it. So I was able to get the exact quilt that I wanted for the exact show since that was the only color design inspiration I've basically given for this particular production. The next one is one of my world premiere shows that I got to do in Chicago. This was a storefront theater. Um, basically, when it comes to a storefront theater, you can see here, it's not very big. The stage space is 12 feet by 12 feet, about the size of an average master bedroom, if you're lucky. <laughs> and it fit about 35 seats. So it was a very small space. So with this particular show, it was a world premiere and it was based upon this musician who was having this kind of meltdown. And the play was set up very much like the movie Memento. I don't know if people are getting a couple of nods. Yes, okay. So basically the first scene of the play is the last part of the story. The next scene you get a little bit more and then you get that end again. The next scene you get a little bit more and the end again and by the time you get to the end of the show, you get the entire story. And it was all about this musician and how he's not sure if his life means anything. And the director for this production wanted me to create the old CBGB's bathroom, uh, gr grunge kind of punk era. So I really got to use a lot of my tagging skills um, to be able to do this production. I was given an empty black space, a bunch of spray paint and old posters, and uh, got to have a lot of fun. Um, it was one of the best productions I was able to do, but since the space was so small, it was very hard to get any stage photos, 
because imagine trying to get a full wide shot when you're only like, it, it's really weird. So I was able to get this shot, but I thought it was really great because it shows the color and the differentiate between what's going on. But again, showing it's a really small space. So something completely different now. Uh, this is crumbs from the table of joy. Now this particular production was my senior capstone when I was an undergrad. Um, this particular show uh, is about 1930s Chicago, and it's an African-American family who moves there to follow the words of a preacher um, that the father is basically very drawn to. And the father then meets, falls in love, and marries a white woman who they describe to be very much like Marlene Diedrich. And she actually, in the play, does a little Marlene Diedrich dance number because in the production, the play is set in a realistic setting and then has dream sequences. What I mean by that is on the design, I'll go to the, this is one of my renderings and this is the second one, it'll be easier to explain. This here is the realistic setting. We had a refrigerator that when you opened it had a light on. Very, very realistic, tangible elements. But then on the stage, that was here behind these building-shaped projection screens, was our dream sequence. The play had two young daughters in it, and those two, whenever they talked by themselves, would make elaborate, exaggerative stories about what was really happening in their life, what was really happening with the stepmother. So anytime they were on this platform, they were able to create those imaginary, exciting experiences to be able to differentiate between the realism of what's happening in real life and the stage of what they would like life to be like. Here's the model. a painter's elevation. For this particular production, uh, my assignment was to do everything computer generated. Um, when I started off in design, um, I was not a very good artist. Um, and I didn't, my professor wanted me to know that that did not hinder my ability to be a good designer. He just meant that I needed to find another way of expressing my art. I was able to do these kinds of work using a computer until I was able to make my hand catch up to my brain. So I was not able to have to stop doing what I wanted to do because I wasn't good at one particular element of the job. I just found something else to help me until I can make this catch up to this. And I thought that was very helpful and very inspirational kind of motivation for me to not give up when you have people who have been artists their entire lives. So these are some of the stage production um, photos. Again, realistic down here, and then we have the stage up there. This is the girls up there doing one of their little dream uh, spoken word uh, moments that they have. We have the love tussle between the two main lovers, uh, the family in despair, and then the girls upset over there again. We have the subway car on the side. In this scene, that's where the actress who plays the mother has actually a Marlene Diedrich outfit underneath, and she stands up on the table and rips it off and starts doing the dance, and then puts the dress back on and sits down, and they continue eating dinner. <laughs> like nothing happened. It's so great. It's one of those things where you're like, really? Does that only happen in my house? So um, one of the things that I also had to do for this production is work with multimedia. So with those projection screens that were in the back, I created layered projections that were not only simple images, but were able to describe the feeling and the motivation of what was going on in the time. This particular piece dealt with a lot of the racial issues that were happening in the 1930s in Chicago. Um, a lot of the segregation, a lot of just the angst of what was going on. So I tried to create that with my um, PowerPoints to create very strong, prominent images that weren't too distracting from the play, but were still able to get the feeling of what was happening at the time. So, completely different now, completely absurdist, we have finer noble gases. Now this particular play is about three young guys who are into uh, substances that they shouldn't be, and what happens when they deal with those things. So for this particular production, because we were dealing with the 
intoxication factor, I wanted to make sure to add that to my design elements. I wanted to create their hypnotic state into what the feeling of their apartment was gonna be like. What did these people really live? How is this play and why are they like this? Now, this play was written uh, right after 9-11. So there's a lot of angst and anger towards the American government and these kids, uh, these kids or guys in the play are very, very angry. So there's a lot of that kind of sentiment into the design as well, which did not go over well with the audience, but needed to happen for the production. So this is the first slide. Again, very grungy. This is actually a cast member. He lays there the entire show until, until the end where he stands up, he does a little drum number and then does this baby cry to a sound of corrals of cell phones, old Nokia things, very, very powerful. I don't know why it's their stuff, but um, there are these, uh, for these characters, there are these three uh, containers on top of the coffee table very stylish. Uh, there is the blues, which are the downers, the reds, which are the uppers, and the yellows, which are the neutralizers. And during the play, they'll pop in different ones and different aspects will happen. In this particular scene, they're trying to escape and take their television that they have with them. Why don't they go through the front door? I don't know, that's part of the play. That's what they're doing. Um, again, he just lays there and they just graffiti him the entire show. Um, the next slide shows kind of the more transitional uh, piece. There is a scene in this show where one of the guys actually befriends a little girl at the park and they do this elephant uh, bear dance. They wear an elephant and a bear mask and then they dance in this red light and she wears rollerblades. I still don't know why it's in the script, but it was really cool to do and to, to make, so. Uh, when we did this particular production, though, the design element was really eye-catching. The script called for a 10-foot uh, robot that was made out of McDonald's Happy Meal boxes that these guys created in their space, and we wanted to make sure that the rest of the space came across with that same intent. So a lot of our walls were cluttered with uh, heavy metal band rock posters. Um, there was a flag that was uh, a flag. We had an R2-D2 trash can with tons of McDonald's wrappers sticking out of it. The sink was, which used to, was sink, used to be a television, and you can see that they obviously don't do their dishes either, so keeping it really messy. There's lots of messages on the walls that are tagged up, bring them back, bring them home. I, I, I particularly like the hanging of the, the dolls. I thought that was pretty weird and kind of eccentric. Uh, but uh, the walls were also a really interesting, excuse me, a really interesting texture, because we didn't just go straight paint. On the walls, we added cardboard, different types of fabrics, um, different layers of corrugated materials, and then painted on top of those. So the walls weren't flat, they had layers, they had corrosion, and made it feel like it had been lived in. This is a lived in, dirty apartment with an R2-D2 trash can. Who would want to live there? So my last production for theater that I'd like to go over is um, The Haunting of Hill House. Now with The Haunting of Hill House, um, this particular production was interesting because of the fact that the house or the set was going to be an additional character in the play. So when it came to this particular production, I wanted to make sure that the house said something, did something. And in the play there was a moment where the house had a transformation and came into being. And I wanted to show you what that transformation looked like after I guess show you the rest of the slides. <laughs> kind of hard to see with the light hitting it, but basically the black lights are coming up and the wallpaper has been painted with black light and fluorescent paint, which actually pulsates in the black light to create it look like it's kind of waking up. So 
When working on this production, one of the other things that I had to think about was how to create those elements of the house coming to life. So in one of the scenes, one of the girls has this room and she goes in there and she becomes possessed and then goes to the tower and then if you've seen the movie or read the play, it's, it's the same. Um, but with this particular headboard, I wanted to create something different. I wanted to create something interesting. So we made this headboard uh, straight out of ourselves. So for this production, during that scene where the girl goes and is being basically seduced by the ghost to go to the balcony to kill herself, um, <laughs> we wanted to make sure to create something interesting and creepy. So the headboard has actually been created and the center is actually dance fabric. Um, and we were able to attach it in a way that it wouldn't snap back, but actually kept its form, so that the actors were able to put their faces in and they were able to talk through it and create these really interesting, creepy moments, which worked really well with the play, especially when we didn't tell the actress the first time. <laughs> That's always fun. So I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly, um, but I wanted to talk about some of my experiences and what are some of the production elements are for film and special events, unlike theater. So when it comes to film, our uh, tele uh, scenic designers are mostly, mostly called production designers, and they're responsible for the concept. Now, some of the shows that you may see, like Walking Dead, they'll create a lot of their sets from scratch very hard to find a post-apocalyptic town just sitting there, you know, maybe. But then we have other shows like Downton Abbey where they actually find a particular castle and then do it in that particular place and that's called finding the location. I was able and fortunate to work on a series of Napa Auto Parts commercial with Partisan Entertainment, uh, which is based out of an LA company that works a lot in North Carolina. With this particular production, we were doing three different commercials, excuse me, five different commercials, but I have three here, um, basically showing these guys playing these party games with the families and all of the party, <coughs> excuse me, party game answers had to do with automotive parts, which I would never get. So my job was a set dresser and a buyer. As a buyer, um, basically I showed up on set they gave me $1,000 cash, and they gave me a set of keys, and said, this is the stuff that I need. I'll see you tomorrow. In a new town I've never been in, got to do it. So go to Pottery Barn, got to go buy a tea set. Do I buy one tea set? No, you buy three tea sets, because it's film. Because time is money. Because if we set up the tea set, and the director goes on stage and says, that doesn't work, I need something else. If you don't have other options, you're not going to get another job. So having multiple options and multiple things really does make film time is money and having those options ready to go really is what matters. Um, my other job was to make sure, that's me, uh, was to make sure the continuity of the food during the productions of these uh, films. Every time we shoot, we shoot from a different angle, and we have to shoot multiple times with multiple angles. So I needed to make sure that if this angle, the glass was filled up this way, when we filmed from this way, the glass was still filled up the same amount. Why is that important? Because people like me who watch the commercials would then complain about how the fact that it wasn't right. How many of you have ever seen a movie where the guy is smoking a cigarette and it's really long and the next time you see him it's like a little nub, I'm like, that person was not doing their job. There has to be a moment of how long these things are for the continuity of the film, which is something that I was really, really good at. So this particular one was really simple. He read him a, a bedtime story and then all of the auto parts made the car and the car rolled off and was happily ever after. And this one was probably my favorite because we got to do Chinese food. Um, and the Chinese food was actually frozen Chinese food containers. And no matter how much I told uh, the Michael uh, that the food was frozen and not cooked and he shouldn't eat it, he kept trying to eat it. So sometimes we have to wrangle the actors and be like, hey, this is prop food, it's not real. Craft services is there, I can get you a snack, but don't eat it because then I have to fix it. It's not fun. So having that kind of conversation was always Really fun. And the lastly, but not least, um, I was lucky enough to work in special events. When I was uh, an undergrad, I took a part-time job, um, and I worked uh, at a hotel, started off at front desk, and then transferred into banquet uh, services and special events. Um, and I, because of that, I became a wedding planner. Um, it was one of the things that I was able to do uh, to make money on the side, but also reinforce my skills as a set designer. 
Um, I was able to do quite a few, but these are the three that I was given permission by the brides to, to show. So this one is a 200 person wedding where we had to construct the centerpieces um, and they had small gift bags. Uh, this one was pretty simple, pretty traditional. The next one was a much larger, it was a 350 person wedding, which was at the Union League Club of Chicago. This one had a budget of about 55 to $60,000. So I had lots of stuff to play with, um, which was great. See the, these nice little gift bags? Do you wanna tell you that's in there? Little bottles of champagne for all their guests. These people with money. Oh. So, uh, and this is the last one. It's a smaller wedding. It's only about 100 people, but it had a completely different style um, to the look and very kind of homey. So the set designer is responsible for designing the sets and creating the world for film, television, and plays, also special events. A simple set can often be created by arranging props in a room on a stage, or in some instances, you have to create a, uh, create a room or even a building from scratch. But ultimately, simply put, a set designer can find work wherever sets need to be built or designed, and imagined spaces need to be created. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah. We don't need this. If somebody wants to ask any questions, you're more than welcome to. Yes. What is your, do you have a film or a play that you would love to design the set for? Um, <laughs> there are quite a few uh, plays that I would like to design a set for. Uh, there's a children's show called Still Life with Iris, uh, where it's basically where she goes and she uh, falls into this land where everybody wears these heavy coats and these coats describe their jobs. So there's like the thunder bottler whose job is to blow into these bottles and capture thunder. And you get to create those props. And then there's the, so, uh, the mender and he sews these costumes. So you make these really big needles and threads. So it'd be really fun because there's so many creative elements elements to it and I've never been able to do it so that would be one I'd really be interested in <laughs> on it any other questions concerns <laughs> I do have one other plug before uh, you all leave if you are interested in anything that I had to say uh, next semester I am teaching scenic design so if you would like to explore and play with some of these elements please come and take it it's an LAP too Thank you very much.